If there was one thing that every machine learning practitioner had to know, it would be how to minimize a function. Whether you are training a neural network, solving logistic regression, or simply trying to teach a computer how to tell a cat from a dog, chances are, after a lot of really complex looking math, your task will boil down to minimizing one gigantic function. Geometrically, this means finding the lowest point on the function graph. Gradient descent is an extremely popular minimization algorithm. It is iterative, which means that instead of finding the solution all at once, it starts at a random location and then takes repeated steps trying to improve its results. Of course, looking at this simple function, this might seem rather unnecessary. But what if your function looks something like this? Without an obvious solution, iterative algorithms become much more attractive. First, we select a random starting point, after which we'll need to come up with a sequence of steps that will take us to the minimum. But the problem is that there are many different paths we can take. In the one-dimensional case, on each step, we can only go left or right, but in two dimensions, at every point, there are infinitely many directions. If you could only remember one thing after watching this video, I would want it to be this. Gradient descent always moves in the direction of the steepest descent. To gain some intuition, imagine the function graph is a mountain. And let's place a ball on its side. Under the force of gravity, it will naturally start rolling in the direction of the steepest descent. There is a caveat though. As you might have noticed, the ball lacks inertia. In fact, there is a variant of gradient descent that adds inertia. It's called gradient descent with momentum, but while it's closer to the real world physics, it falls beyond the scope of this video and I will cover it separately. Now, given the function, how do we find the direction of the steepest descent? If you've taken calculus, you might remember that it coincides with the negative of the function gradient, where each element is given by a partial derivative. In case you are not familiar with partial derivatives, here is a trick that might help. Say you have a function of two variables. Forget for a moment that y is a variable and treat it as just a number. Then we can use the standard differentiation rules to find the partial derivatives with respect to x. Now let's do the opposite. We freeze x, and then differentiating with respect to y will give us the respective partial derivative. To gain some geometric intuition, let's freeze y at 0. This effectively slices the graph in two. Since y is fixed, f now depends only on x, and becomes a regular function of one variable. Geometrically, the partial derivative with respect to x represents the slope of the graph of f at x. The way to think about it is, if we increase x by a small number delta x, then f will also change by some number delta f. When delta x is getting smaller and smaller, the ratio of these two numbers is approaching the slope of the graph at x. If function f is reasonably well behaved, this property holds for all values of x. If we now differentiate f with respect to x, we'll arrive at the following formula. To find the partial derivative with respect to y, we'll have to reverse the argument, fix x, and then differentiate f with respect to y. Now let's try to run gradient descent on this example function. The partial derivatives for the gradient are given by these expressions, which, if you know calculus, you can verify for yourself. Let's initialize x and y with some random values. To find the gradient, all we need to do is plug these values into our formulas for the derivatives. Now let's move our point in the direction of the steepest descent, which is equivalent to subtracting the gradient from the current values of x and y. Now we should just keep repeating this step and wait for the algorithm to converge. Except, as you might have noticed, it's not converging at all. To see what's going on, let's take a closer look at a single step. We start at the initial point, and as we are moving in the steepest descent direction, function values are dropping. But at some point, 
they start rising again. In other words, our step is too long and we end up overshooting the target. The solution is to multiply the gradient by a carefully selected number that ensures convergence. In machine learning, this number is known as the step size. Now we see that our algorithm converges to the optimal point. A useful exercise would be to calculate these steps for yourself and then compare your results to the video. To sum it up, here are some takeaways. Gradient descent is an iterative minimization method. It starts with an arbitrary solution and then moves in the steepest descent direction that is given by the negative of the gradient. Finally, to control execution and prevent overshooting, we multiply each gradient by a selected step size. So if you've made it this far, you already know the theory behind gradient descent. To put these concepts to use, in my next video, I will show how to apply them in practice. We will write a program that uses gradient descent to solve a real-world data science problem. In the meantime, I have the following question for you. What do you think are the limitations of gradient descent? Can you come up with an example where it doesn't work? Please let me know in the comments below. Until next time, and thank you for watching.